Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to this Facebook Live uh, session on behalf of Cardiopathy UK. Um, my name is Juan Pablo Caski. I'm um, an associate professor of paediatric inherited uh, cardiovascular diseases at University College London and a consultant at Great Ormond Street Hospital, where I lead the inherited uh, cardiovascular diseases service. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be involved in this uh, Facebook Live uh, session today. Um, I've been asked to uh, talk a little bit about um, COVID-19 and, and our understanding of where we are at the moment, and uh, particularly in relation to uh, potential effects on, on the heart, and in particular in cardiomyopathies. Um, and what I thought I would do is just to talk for uh, a few minutes on what we understand and know about uh, COVID-19 uh, over the last two years. Um, touch a little bit on the new variant, Omicron, which we're still uh, learning about. Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about vaccination, particularly as it relates to some of the concerns that have been raised uh, around the heart, um, and then focus on, on potential effects of COVID-19, both on the heart and in particular uh, in relation to cardiomyopathies. And that should hopefully take about 15, 20 minutes or so. And then um, I have some questions uh, that have been sent in that I'll uh, try to go through and, um, and, and, and answer. Um, so just to start off with what we know about, about COVID-19, and um, it, it's really incredible to think that, that it was only two years ago, in fact, almost, almost exactly two years ago, that the first cases of COVID-19 were being uh, reported from Wuhan in China. It feels like a lot longer uh, than that. Um, but certainly in the last two years, we have learned uh, a lot uh, about this condition. Um, and there have also been incredible um, advances uh, in terms of our understanding of the condition, but also in terms of uh, trials for treatments for COVID-19 and, and also the, the incredible uh, development of vaccines for, for, for COVID-19. Um, I think we, we've known from very early on that uh, COVID-19 is primarily a respiratory illness, and, and we can see that from the common symptoms that the, the people who, who um, contract COVID-19 get, so things like a cough and a sore throat and uh, upper respiratory tract uh, symptoms, a runny nose, that sort of thing. Um, but it also became apparent quite early on that it, it wasn't just a respiratory illness and that actually many other organ systems uh, within the body are very commonly affected by COVID-19. So that includes um, the kidneys, the liver, the neurological system. So that, that's expressed by that very um, uh, unique uh, set of symptoms that include uh, uh, difficulty with or loss of, loss of smell and, and, and loss of taste. Um, and also the heart uh, was one of the organs that it became apparent sort of quite early on that could potentially be affected. Um, initially, we thought or people thought that um, the effects on, on the lungs and on the other organ systems within the body were most likely related to a direct damage by the virus on those specific organs and tissues. But what's become apparent um, is that, in fact, many of the symptoms um, and particularly many of the more serious symptoms that people who, who do catch COVID get are probably caused not by the virus itself, but by the body's immune response or the inflammatory response um, of the body. So there's this um, hyper-inflammatory response that the, 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 the body develops in some people who, who, who contract COVID-19 that is responsible for some of those uh, manifestations that affect the lungs and, and, and other organ systems also. Uh, over time, we've seen um, different variants of COVID-19 or the virus, SARS-CoV-2, um, uh, that have become more dominant. Um, so starting off with the alpha variant, it, then the beta most recently the Delta variant and, and now the new uh, Omicron uh, variant. And these have all caused um, separate distinct uh, waves um, uh, that we've seen in the UK, but also in, in other parts of the, of, of the world. And um, certainly in the initial stages of the, of the pandemic, those uh, waves were largely uh, brought under control eventually through social distancing uh, uh, measures. More recently, um, the, the arrival of the, of the vaccination programs has, has helped um, to, to, to manage, with, uh, to manage those, those waves. 
Uh, we know that for most people with COVID-19, um, it, it's a mild disease. So most individuals who contract the virus have very mild uh, symptoms. Some people have no symptoms at all. But we know sadly um, that for a small number of, of individuals who contract uh, the virus, um, that the that illness can be very, very severe and it can result in hospital admissions, intensive care treatments, and, and in some cases in, in death, as, as we're all very, uh, very, uh, very well aware. We know, and I'll touch on this a little bit later on, but we know that vaccinations uh, and social distancing measures, but particularly the vaccine program, has helped to uh, reduce the rates at, at which individuals who catch the virus become very significantly unwell. Uh, so reduced uh, hospitalizations and deaths from COVID-19, even when infection rates uh, continue to, to go up. Uh, one of the uh, features of the of COVID-19 that uh, epidemiologists, virologists and, and, and doctors around the world have been uh, particularly interested in, uh, in understanding is, is identifying those individuals who are perhaps most vulnerable, uh, or who are most likely to become more unwell and to need hospital treatment and, and intensive care treatment. Um, and there's some data now to show that that whereas for most people the, the, the illness is likely to be very mild, there are certain groups of patients that we know are more vulnerable. And these are the groups of patients that were advised to shield uh, during the first wave of the, of, of the pandemic. And it includes uh, people who are immunosuppressed, um, either through um, illnesses such as cancers or because of medication that they're on, uh, individuals who have received transplants, so including cardiac uh, transplantation, because the drugs that, that, that they're on can cause immunosuppression, can reduce the immune response of the body, uh, and also uh, individuals with or adults with congenital heart disease, uh, particularly those women who with congenital heart disease who are, who are pregnant. Um, we also know that um, in individuals who don't have those sort of vulnerable features, um, there are some factors that are really important in determining the likelihood of becoming more unwell and, and needing hospital treatment and intensive care. And probably the most important of those is age. So we know that older individuals and certain individuals over the age of 60 or 65 or so um, do seem to have a higher risk of becoming more unwell uh, with COVID-19 and needing hospital treatment intensive care than uh, younger people are. Uh, and we also know that individuals who have other medical conditions um, are also more at risk and this particularly relates to things like diabetes high blood pressure uh, and, and obesity. So these are risk factors that we, that over the course of the last two years have been identified as, as uh, increasing the risk of, of becoming more unwell um, with, with COVID-19. Um, just thinking a little bit about the, the uh, Omicron variant, it's you know, clearly still very early days we um, we're still learning um, ab about uh, this particular variant this is a variant that was only uh, really identified for the first time in South Africa a few weeks ago um, and uh, was sequenced as, as uh, representing a different variant uh, because of a number of different mutations that the virus carried within its genetic uh, makeup um, so we, we are still learning about it but but what we do know um, certainly within the UK is that the numbers are rising and going up extremely quickly, so much more quickly uh, than was the case with some of the previous variants that we that, that developed into, into waves. Um, and I you probably saw the, the uh, press conference uh, uh, today, uh, and certainly the numbers of infected individuals today were the highest they've ever been at any stage uh, in, in the pandemic. And that just tells us that this is a, a virus that, that is extremely infectious and that the numbers are going up really very rapidly. So it's I think it's estimated now in the UK that, that the doubling times, so that, that's basically how long it takes for the number of infected individuals to, to double in size. Uh, that's now estimated at, at two days or possibly even uh, even less than that. So, and so this Omicron variant, although it's only been around uh, for, for, for a very short period of time, it's now becoming the dominant variant uh, in, in the UK. 
It's important also to realize though that the, the previous variant, the Delta variant is also still increasing. So cases of the, of the Delta variant are also going up at the same time as we're seeing these rapid rises in Omicron. Um, it, the, with the Delta variant, it seems to be particularly in children and in unvaccinated individuals that the Delta variant is continuing to rise, whereas in the, the, the Omicron variant tends to be uh, rising in slightly older populations, including individuals who've been who've been vaccinated. Um, but we certainly know now that with Omicron, uh, whereas initially there was a, a concern that the, the cases of Omicron that were being detected in the UK were the result of, of individuals returning from, from foreign travel. Um, there's no doubt now that, that the Omicron variant is, is really increasing mostly as a result of community uh, transmission, so almost entirely as a result of, of community transmission. And, and this uh, is the reason why the government very recently um, removed the, the, the travel red list. So most of the cases are now within, within the UK. There's uh, some data to suggest that this Omicron variant uh, results in, in reduced effectiveness of the vaccine, so that vaccines aren't quite as effective against the Omicron variant as they were in some of the previous uh, variants, particularly with the AstraZeneca um, vaccine. Um, but the good news is that the evidence that we have so far suggests that the booster um, is extremely effective. So it increases the effectiveness up to over 70% um, of the sort of pre-booster uh, level of, of, of effectiveness. And that happens very quickly. It seems to happen within the first week or so of having a booster. And, and it happens regardless of which vaccine you had at the beginning. So if you had uh, two doses of AstraZeneca, but you then get a booster of, of Moderna or, or Pfizer, that, that increases the effectiveness of the vaccine against Omicron to the same level as somebody who's been vaccinated with Pfizer um, all the way all, all the way across. Um, it, it certainly seems, vaccines certainly seem to be effective in terms of reducing symptomatic uh, infection. We still don't know what the effect of Omicron or the effects of the vaccine on Omicron will be in relation to hospitalizations uh, and to more severe uh, disease and, and, and to mortality. Um, there are some data emerging from South Africa that suggests that perhaps uh, this variant is maybe not as severe as the Delta variant was in terms of causing very severe disease and hospital admissions and and deaths um, but it's very difficult to to interpret those data from South Africa in terms of the UK population because there are important differences between um, the South African population and and the UK population so I think it'll it'll still be a, a, a few weeks before we're able to truly understand the impact of the uh, Omicron variant in terms of more severe disease and hospital admissions intensive care treatment and 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 deaths um, even if this variant is, is milder or less severe than the Delta variant, though, because it's so infectious and because there are so many individuals who are likely to, to, to catch COVID or the Omicron variant of COVID-19 uh, over the next few weeks, even if it's only a small proportion of individuals who end up needing very uh, significant care, intensive care and hospital admissions, a small proportion of a very large number of infected patients would still be a large number. And so it's extremely important to uh, follow government guidance to ensure uh, social distancing measures uh, uh, are in place, that people wear masks, particularly in, in crowded places, and certainly try to avoid uh, very crowded and indoor places wherever wherever possible. Um, and, and certainly a, 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 an increase in the number of uh, patients needing intensive care treatment or, or hospital admission could potentially have a very significant impact on, on the NHS, as, as we've seen from, the, from today's uh, press conference. Uh, one of the other things that also is becoming apparent about the Omicron variant is that reinfections are much more common with this variant. And that's probably related to the fact that it, it escapes uh, immunity from the vaccine with with just two doses of, of, of the vaccine. Um, so we are seeing um, a much, much higher rates of individuals who've already had COVID catching the Omicron variant um, than we were seeing with previous variants of, of, of COVID-19. And, and much of that is related to household transmission. So um, with previous variants, it was not unusual for 
some members of the household who were perhaps exposed to the virus not to develop, uh, not to catch COVID, not to test positive for COVID. Um, that seems less likely with Omicron from what we from what we know. So household transmission seems to be um, significantly uh, more common with the Omicron variant. But as I say, we're still learning about this variant with so virologists, epidemiologists um, are, are still collecting the data both from other parts of the world, but also from, from the UK. But the numbers certainly do seem to be going up very, very quickly with this with this variant. The, the, the next thing that I wanted to just touch on briefly was the issue of vaccination. So it's really good news that the booster uh, does seem to have a significant benefit, beneficial impact on, on, on Omicron. Um, the, um, one of the things that one of the concerns that people have sort of raised and, and certainly when we see um, families in, in, in our clinics, it's one of the questions that, that um, families very often ask is the um, how safe uh, vaccinations are in, in, in terms of the heart, particularly in individuals who already have pre-existing heart disease. And this is a concern that was raised um, a few months ago by uh, the observation that a very small number of individuals who received particularly the um, the mRNA vaccines, so the, the, the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine, and particularly young men and, and teenage boys um, who'd received those vaccines. There was this observation that a very small number of those individuals um, seem to develop uh, what we call a myocarditis, which is a, a, an inflammation of the, of the muscle of the heart. Um, since then, actually, there have been uh, a, a lot of data on um, how common this is uh, in, in, in the vaccinated population. There was a study that was published um, very, very recently in the last couple of weeks um, from uh, the University of Oxford, um, looking specifically at this at this issue and, and reassuring you what they what they found was that the the, the rate of uh, that particular complication of, uh, of myocarditis following the COVID vaccine was, was actually extremely low. So they estimated that between one and 10 extra cases of myocarditis, so on top of what the background population rate of myocarditis would be, so not related to COVID or the vaccine, but an extra one to 10 extra cases of myocarditis were being observed for every million vaccines given. So really very rare. Um, and, and that compares with over 40 extra cases of myocarditis for every million cases of COVID infection itself. So the risk of developing this myocarditis, this inflammation of the heart muscle with the vaccine is significantly lower than the risk of developing exactly the same thing from, the, from COVID infection itself. Um, the other evidence that's now coming to, to light, and a number of studies from around the world have shown this now, is that for those very rare cases where individuals do, um, uh, do develop a myocarditis as a result of the vaccine, um, the vast majority of those individuals recover very quickly, and most of them recover completely as well. Um, and so certainly our advice in clinic has has always been that uh, that the vaccine is safe from a from a cardiac um, point of view and that the the risk of a heart related complication from the vaccine is much, much lower than the risk uh, of the same complication of myocarditis from infection with COVID itself. Um, now it's thinking a little bit about the, the way that COVID can affect the heart. So clearly myocarditis, inflammation of the heart muscle is one of the ways in which um, COVID infection has been shown to, to potentially affect um, uh, the, the, the heart. Um, and as I mentioned before, initially there was a, a suspicion that, that that was directly related to the, uh, the, the virus uh, itself targeting and damaging the heart muscle cells. And there's some evidence to suggest that in part that may be the case, but mostly it's related to the immune response. So the body's response to the virus is what creates this inflammation that can settle in the heart as well as in other, other organs of the um, of, 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 of the body. Um, other ways in which the heart can be affected, and again, this is 
primarily related to inflammation rather than an effect of the virus itself um, is with symptoms of heart failure. So breathlessness, some of the uh, blood markers that we measure that we uh, use to determine uh, whether somebody's symptoms are related to heart failure or not, they tend to go up with COVID as well. But we know that that can also happen with lung disease. So it doesn't necessarily mean that COVID is causing heart failure itself, but it, but it, it can cause symptoms that are similar to heart failure. We've seen in some individuals rarely that COVID can cause abnormal heart rhythms, so extra beats and abnormal heart rhythms. But again, that seems to be very, very rare. Um, and we've uh, we, we've seen also uh, that COVID can cause uh, the development of blood clots um, in the in the blood vessels, um, and um, and that's something that again is is very clearly the result of inflammation. So the response of the body to the virus, rather than the virus itself being responsible um, for, for these for these blood clots. And in children, so I'm a pediatric cardiologist. So in children, uh, one of the uh, conditions that we've seen is this inflammatory multi-system inflammatory um, disorder called PIMS TS which is similar to uh, a, another very rare condition we see sometimes in children called Kawasaki um, disease but that again is an inflammatory condition that can affect the muscle of the heart it can also affect the coronary arteries so it can cause the coronary arteries to become dilated become enlarged um, and, we, and we've certainly seen some children uh, who contract COVID who several weeks after the COVID infection can develop the this very rare complication. Again, from the data that we have, most of those children actually seem to recover very, very well, can recover completely and, and often recover very quickly. So when we're following these children up several weeks after their presentation, most of the cardiac abnormalities have improved and, and settled down. Pro probably the, the, the more important um, risk from a cardiac point of view from the from the covid pandemic is is the effect the impact that it may have on non covid related heart disease so there's a lot of evidence to 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 show that during the initial waves of the of the pandemic um the number of individuals being uh, treated for things like heart attacks and stroke uh, went down significantly during that wave and that was probably related to people not wanting to seek medical attention or seeking medical attention later than usual um because um because of the, you know, the fact that uh, hospitals the nhs was focused on on treating uh covid and also a perception that perhaps you know people didn't want to want, want to bother uh the nhs with symptoms that they weren't so sure about because of the of the focus on on treating um covid 19 and and, and certainly that's something that, that that we've learned from the initial waves of the of the, of the pandemic and so i you know would sort of say that the uh, the as has been sort of said before uh, that, that, that the NHS remains open um, for all of those normal um, things that, that would have that would have happened prior to the, to the to the pandemic. And so, if anybody does have symptoms that are um, that they're worried about, that, that if they feel unwell in any way, anything that would suggest a heart related condition, then it's really important to access um, NHS services um, to make sure that we we, we treat and we identify and, and treat these conditions um, uh, early. Um, and related to that, I think, is the issue of the backlog. So as a result of the pandemic, there are significant backlogs in terms of in terms of treatment um, and assessment for, for for heart disease and for and for many other diseases also, but it, but it's really important um, um, that uh, that you know that you do attend uh, outpatient appointments when they're when when they're offered and that it, and that you do seek medical advice if 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 you're symptomatic and and um, uh, and, and are worried in in, in any way. Um, thinking more specifically about the cardiomyopathies, actually. From the evidence that we have so far, it doesn't seem as though COVID-19 has a significant impact uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, worsening uh, the, the, the heart in individuals who already have a cardiomyopathy. And it also doesn't seem that uh, individuals who have a pre-existing cardiomyopathy are at risk of developing more severe disease. There's very little about this in the medical literature. And actually what that tells us is that it's it's probably very rare for individuals with cardiomyopathy to become very unwell with COVID-19. Um, and that, that certainly has been 
our own experience in uh, children with cardiomyopathies. We haven't seen uh, children with cardiomyopathies becoming very sick, very unwell, needing intensive care. Uh, and I think that experience is also uh, the same as what our adult cardiomyopathy colleagues are reporting also. Um, there was a, a small study uh, that was published very recently from Italy looking specifically at the impact of COVID on adults with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And what they showed was that there wasn't an increase in uh, hospitalizations or severe disease in adults who had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. What they did show was that just like with any other um, individual who contracts COVID, the, the same risk factors that apply in the general population also applied in individuals with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So it was generally age, so the older individuals and those with comorbidities, those with high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, that were more likely to become more unwell and to become uh, and to need hospital admission and, and intensive care. So the evidence that we have so far suggests that actually for most people with cardiomyopathy, uh, COVID is not um, uh, something that will that, that will result in a very uh, severe um, uh, illness. Now, again, it's important to, to interpret that with a little bit of caution. Um, it may be that part of the reason for that is that the cardiomyopathy community are very good at following social distancing advice um, and at, at getting vaccinated. Um, and so particularly with the increasing uh, numbers of Omicron uh, that we're currently experiencing, it's really important um, to continue to follow that guidance. So continue to wear masks indoors, avoid very crowded indoor spaces as much as possible, avoid public transport as much as you can, um, uh, make sure you're sort of following social distancing guidelines. And, and as I mentioned before, um, make sure that you get the, the, the booster uh, when, when, when you're eligible for, for that. Um, although there's no significant, no real evidence for this, as a community, as a group of, of cardiomyopathy doctors, um, we have suggested that there are certain features that um, patients with cardiomyopathy, if they have these, that they should be particularly careful. So for example, patients with cardiomyopathy who have uh, significantly impaired function, pumping function of the heart, both of the right or the left ventricle, um, or patients with cardiomyopathy who are very symptomatic, um, then they should also, they should be particularly careful. And also the older uh, age groups, are those who are above the age of sort of 60 or 65, um, should just perhaps be a little bit more careful um uh with, with social distancing and mask wearing and and uh, and, and again ensuring that, that they they get vaccinated um and that's the advice that we've also given to children uh, uh, as well so children with cardiomyopathy who are very symptomatic or who have uh impaired uh pumping function of the heart we just advise them to be a little bit more cautious um than than perhaps uh the the, the general um population um so i i think that's uh, really all I wanted to say in terms of where where we are and what sort of understanding we currently have of, of COVID, particularly uh, in relation to the, the Omicron um, variant that we are still still learning about, uh, and particularly in relation to the, to the cardiomyopathies. Um, so I think we've still got a few minutes left. So what I'll do, if that's okay, is just go through some of the questions that were um, that, that were sent in before this, um, but before the live stream uh, started. So I'll, I'll sort of read those, read those out, and I'll, I'll try and answer them as best I best I can. Um, so the, the first question um, from Abby is: I, I admit to being more worried about the general health of the NHS at the moment uh, than anything COVID related. And given what is likely to be a very difficult winter for the NHS, are there any tips you can give us to navigate the system? regarding our own cardiomyopathy care, as well as our ongoing health. Um, so I think that's a really, really important question. As I uh, uh, alluded to before, I, I, I think that's correct. I think probably the, the, the impact um, of COVID in terms of heart disease is probably more in relation to um, the NHS being overwhelmed than any direct uh, sort of COVID-related heart disease itself. Um, I think, you know, it's really, as I mentioned just now, it's really important, particularly with rising cases, that 
everybody stays as safe as possible. So the, to follow uh, social distancing guidance, um, to uh, wear masks in, in, in indoor places and in public uh, spaces, um, and to, to get the, the, the boost of vaccination or to get vaccinated, receive the first course of vaccination if you've not been vaccinated yet. Um, really important also to, to look after your own health. And, and that's both the uh, your sort of physical health, but also the mental health, um, which we know has has uh, in many uh, individuals over the course of the pandemic has 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 uh, taken a taken a significant hit, um, and so it, you know it's it is important to go out when you can to maybe try and do as many things outdoors as possible. And it's very difficult in the winter to do that, um, but 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 to try to go out and again just stay safe uh, when when you are doing any of those uh, any of those things to to protect yourselves but also to, to protect others and, and try to prevent the NHS from becoming overwhelmed. Um, I guess the other thing I would say is just a bit of a plea just to be kind to NHS staff because um, it, this really has been a very difficult last two years as it has been for everybody um, um, for, for the NHS and I, and I know that the, you know, particularly sort of frontline uh, workers um, uh, have been sort of working extremely hard to to deliver the best possible care uh, over the last two years and it, and it has been a very difficult um, time for it for, for, for everybody. Um, the next uh, question from Lizzie is I have a, uh, have severe allergic reactions to penicillin and tramadol and allergic reactions to some cosmetics and food because of this the doctors uh, spoke to me before my first and second jab and advised me not to have Pfizer uh, because I'm on anticoagulants they were happy for me to have AstraZeneca uh, my GPs referred me for allergy tests. Uh, in the meantime, I need a booster, but struggle to get AstraZeneca. Uh, the question is, how can I find someone that will give AstraZeneca to ensure that I'm covered? And that's a very good question. Um, it, it's it's one that I that I had to look up because it's outside my area of expertise. But actually, what's interesting is that the the most recent guidance now recommends that. Uh, that you can have any vaccine, even if you have had previous allergic reactions to uh, to things like penicillin uh, and to uh, food uh, and and uh, sort of dog hair, cat hair, and and, and uh, dust mites, etc. And so the current recommendations now is that any vaccine is safe, um, and there's no suggestion that the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine are any more likely to result in an allergic reaction. Um, than the AstraZeneca vaccine. But I would certainly encourage you to speak to your GP um, ab about this. Uh, and we have certainly had very rare cases where um, uh, in, in children who have uh, who have a very uh, well established, very well known uh, allergy where we've recommended that vaccination is done either at the GP surgery or, or uh, in a hospital day ward. Um, just to, to make sure that, that we're able to treat them if they do develop an, an allergic reaction. But the most recent guidance suggests that, that any, any vaccine is, is suitable, even in, in, in individuals with, with known uh, drug allergies. Uh, the next question is, um, my son has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and aortic root dilatation. He has additional conditions, including autism and learning disabilities, he's 15. How can I help him to understand his condition? No symptoms at present or what should I be looking out for? And also what impact could the vaccine have on his condition? Uh, he's now had two vaccines. If he were to be affected by the virus, how severe could it become even after having two vaccines? Um, so I guess I'll, I'll sort of answer the second part of that question first, which is in relation to, 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 to the vaccines. So uh, as I've mentioned before, we have a lot of evidence now to show that the vaccine is safe, uh, even in children and, and, and teenagers. Um, and you know, the fact that he's already had two doses of the vaccine is, is extremely reassuring. And that's, what we're, that, that's what's currently being recommended at the moment. Um, uh, so for, for teenagers, the recommendation at the moment is two is now, is now two vaccines, and certainly for children with with cardiac disease, that's that's been the recommendation. There hasn't been any suggestion of boosters um, for teenagers and children yet, but that may well that may well come. Um, in terms of how likely is he to be affected by the virus, were he to catch it? So I guess the fact that he's had two doses of vaccine means that it's much less likely. Uh, that he will that he will catch the virus and and if he were to 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 get it then almost certainly um, he will 
only develop mild symptoms. And that's certainly what we have seen uh, in, in the pediatric population. Um, the vast majority of children who contract COVID tend to have very mild uh, symptoms. And it's very rare for us to see children, even children with heart disease, um, to become very unwell uh, as, as a result of, of COVID. Um, the first part of that question is not strictly speaking related to to COVID, but it's in terms of helping him to understand the condition. And actually, um, the, um, the the first thing that I would say is that it's probably worth speaking to uh, to his cardiology team, his cardiomyopathy team. So most pediatric cardiomyopathy um, teams have excellent uh, specialist nurses or genetic nurses who are very good at delivering information and, and helping you to to explain the condition uh, in, in a way that your child will, will understand. Um, that's certainly the approach that we take at, at Great Ormond Street Hospital. Um, so it's something we do in partnership with, with, with the parents. Um, there's also very good um, uh, information available, for example, from the Cardiomyopathy UK website. So there are there are specific resources now available for um, for children and teenagers that explain the conditions and explain um, what happens when you come to hospital, what tests you need to have done, what those tests involve, etc., uh, and explain those in in a way that uh, that are designed for for younger children um, and and for teenagers also to understand. So I would encourage you to to log on to the Cardiomyopathy UK um, website for those uh, for those resources, but also speak to speak to the, the cardiologist looking after um, your son. Um, the next question is, um, I've had two jabs, so AstraZeneca plus the booster this year. I uh, had lots of problems with DVT with the AstraZeneca jabs, and since the Moderna, I've been sleeping for 14 to 16 hours a day. Um, if I had a big gap between the problem vaccinations and the future one, would it still be effective, or is it only working due to the buildup of vaccine in my body? So I, I'm really sorry to hear about the, the complications, and we certainly know that for a very small um, number of um, uh, individuals who receive the vaccine, particularly the AstraZeneca vaccine, that, that there is this slightly increased risk of blood clots um, developing. Um, the and we also know that that lethargy and tiredness and sleepiness can be a side effect of of the vaccines, particularly the mRNA vaccines and, and Moderna in particular. Um, but that should that shouldn't be a long lasting thing. That should be something that gets better fairly quickly within a few days. So if that's something that's still happening, I would definitely encourage you to ask your GP to speak to your GP about that. In terms of the gap between vaccines and between future boosters, so uh, I guess you've you've had your booster now. So at the moment we don't know how long the effect of the booster will last, but it certainly appears to be the case that um, for uh, that following the second dose uh, of, of vaccination with any of the of the different vaccines, um, that immunity does seem to wane after about three or six months, three to six months. And so um, I think if there is evidence to suggest that the same thing happens with the booster, and we, and we don't have that yet, but if there were evidence to suggest that, uh, and it was recommended that you have your booster at a certain time interval, so three months or six months after your last booster, then I, I, I would certainly suggest that that would be the right thing um, to do, because there, there was certainly evidence that immunity started to wane after a few months following the second dose of vaccination. Um, so I've just got another two questions that came via social media um, that I'll that I'll sort of quickly answer in the last couple of minutes that I think we have. Um, so one is, uh, can a nine-year-old live a normal life if he has cardiomyopathy? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. So the the aim of all of the treatment that we deliver to children with cardiomyopathies is to allow them to live as normal a life as possible. Um, that everybody who has a cardiomyopathy will be different. Um, so some children with cardiomyopathy, in fact, most children with cardiomyopathy are, are often extremely well, um, have very few symptoms, and often the symptoms are easy to control. And we try not to restrict uh, what children with cardiomyopathy do in most cases. Sometimes children do develop symptoms and do need treatment um, with, with medication, for example, or sometimes with, with devices or occasionally, very rarely with, with surgery. But certainly the aim of all of the treatment that we do is to allow them to live a, a normal life, as normal a life as, as possible. Um, and again, I go back to the sort of the multidisciplinary approach that we use certainly in our 
clinic at Great Ormond Street. Um, but but thinking about the the psychological, the psychosocial impact of of having a cardiomyopathy, either yourself or in a relative, is one of the key things that we focus on uh, in 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 our clinic. So not just the medical um, uh, approach, but 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 the um, that thinking about the sort of psychological impact of of that. So yes, the answer is yes for, for most children with cardiomyopathy, they should be able to live a normal life. Um, and then finally, is it safe to have the booster vaccine? Well, I think, I think we've answered that. So um, so certainly all of the evidence that we have um, so far from across the world, not just in the UK, and there are countries that were delivering booster vaccinations before the UK, um, suggest that not only is it safe, but it, it appears to be um, particularly effective um, uh, against this uh, this new Omicron variant that is that, that, that has recently emerged. So I would certainly encourage uh, everybody to to take up the offer of, of, of a booster when it's um, when it's when it's offered. Um, so I think I'm uh, I've probably run out of time. So I um, uh, I didn't have any more questions um, uh, that were sent to me prior to um, uh, pri prior to to, to the uh, live stream. Uh, UK if there are any other questions that, that I haven't answered um, or, or if there's any other information that 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 still um, is, is still missing but um, thank you very much